we will give all the stragglers uh, one more minute. And if they ain't here, we're going. So hold tight for me one more minute, and we'll, we'll kick off. Thanks so much. All right, let's get going. So my name is Jeremy Duncan. I'm going to be your uh, your host, MC tour guide for the next, uh, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes. And uh, we're going to be covering the PATH Act. Um, uh, most everybody that I've talked to has some level of familiarity with the PATH Act. They know approximately what it is. Um, They've got a good idea of how it's going to impact this upcoming season. And uh, some of the things that are in there are honestly, I mean, they're pretty drastic to our industry. It's going to change the way we're doing some things. But uh, we're going to talk about those. We'll talk about, you know, really what are the major impacts of, uh, of the bill and uh, when it was passed and so forth. So the PATH Act is an 880 some odd page bill. Um, it's massive and it, it takes into account all kinds of stuff, military spending, agriculture, um, you name it, it's in there. And so the PATH stands for Protecting Americans Against Tax Hikes. So it, it's HR 2029 is the bill. You can see a link under there which will send this presentation out and you can copy the links and paste them into your browser and go ahead and review it. Just to show you real quick how massive this thing is, I'm going to pull it over. So this is, you should be seeing my web browser. This is just the portion that's covering the taxation. So it's 233 pages. It's got some other stuff in there. And in all honesty, I, I don't want to talk about 233 pages of material. So. I'm giving you my highlights, my main takeaways, and um, things that I think are imperative for us to know. I doubt much of it's going to be a surprise to many of you, as um, most everybody's read some sort of uh, you know, commentary on it as of now. So let's get going. So here's our agenda. We're going to have a quick history lesson. We're going to look at the last five years, kind of where we've been, <clears throat> where we're at. Um, not so much on where we're going, because that's a little unknown. But uh, this, the initial segment, I've labeled as depress you. If you can see that there, I mean, it, it's not a, not a whole lot of positives in the, in the first section. So we'll cover what is the PATH Act, and hopefully during that we'll make you forget you're depressed. Um, and then we'll talk about the provisions, what has been extended and or made permanent. Now, there's a ton of things that have been extended. Some of it has to do with corporate taxes, the way real estate 
uh, transactions are treated and so forth. And so I've got a link here that I think is incredibly um, helpful that would give you better understanding of, uh, of some of those items that I'm not going to cover on. It's, it's more comprehensive than, than what it is we're going to discuss today. So we're going to talk about the major impacts, like I said, uh, the main takeaways, delays, increased due diligence, etc. We'll talk about the fraud prevention measures that the IRS has implemented, um, hopefully protecting our taxpayers' information, and honestly, it's a lot to do with helping them not make improper payments, um, overpaying EITC, a lot to do with identity theft and so forth. And at the end, hopefully we'll take this thing full circle from depressing you to presenting the major opportunities that are, are presented to us and uh, will make you happy. So I uh, wanted to run through kind of a history lesson real quick, just again, kind of a compressed last five years, what's happened, and uh, this is the depressing segment. So I stole a lot of information from one of my good buddies in the industry, his name's Chris Smith uh, from Express Payment Solutions. So, um, I mean, I'm plagiarizing a lot of the material they put together. He's way smarter than I am. He did some amazing analytics on what's going on in the industry, and uh, we'll be talking those over those for the next couple of slides. So give him his appropriate shout out so he doesn't sue us for stealing his material. So uh, tax pros, we, we've been losing market share um, over the last five years. I, I mean, some of us have grown. Some of us have seen the, uh, the decline. And um, it's been challenging for, for many. So why is that? Um, there's a lot of speculation, and the majority of it goes, well, it's the do-it-yourselfers, right? The TurboTax, the free files, the VITA programs. There's a lot of pressure on us um, taking away market share. Now, why is that, right? Where's it going? Well, a lot of people speculate that it's due to the loss of the RAL, right? 2011, the IRS removed the debt indicator. Just being jerks, I mean, there's really no other reason for them to have removed that other than them just being jerks. Um, we've got increased due diligence requirements. We'll talk more on that and um, how that plays in later on in the presentation. And then a huge impact has been the identity theft. I mean, it's, it's crazy the statistics that are associated with identity theft in the taxpayer segment and um, really just fraudulent claims for government benefits. So let's, let's move on and we'll talk about um, kind of where we all make our money. We all make our money in roughly an eight week period. I mean, January 1 to the end of February really constitutes 70, 80, for some of us, 90%. I mean, I know offices that have done 90% of their volume by that point. And a large part, I'm, when we're doing our um, projections, revenue projections and so forth, I mean, we're, we're counting our chickens at that point. We're not worried about them hatching. They've already hatched up to that point. Just to give you, I mean, some statistics in terms of what's funded um, by this point generally, it's 50.13% uh, of all direct deposits. So that's not just they've been submitted at that, that point. If you look down here, in 2014, 50.13% of all direct deposit requests were funded by February 27th. So that is, is huge. That's 53.57% of the total dollars released. So they were the money was out on the street by that that point. That's an estimated 80% of the total bank product market. These are our early filers, right? Here's a generalization of what we're looking at in terms of the return type. One, they're getting a refund. They got refundable credits on their return. They've overpaid whatever. They're getting money back. The returns are fairly straightforward not overly complex. We're not dealing with a uh, whole lot of K-1s, foreign income, or, um, you know, corporate tax return sort of stuff. They are also customers that have a demand for the bank product. Again, we do 80% of our bank product volume in a 
six week period. Some of us it's shorter, some of us it's a little bit longer, but that's that's where we're making the majority of our money. Okay, so let's talk a little bit further. Here's some additional stats. The annual paid tax preparation market share has averaged over 60%. So 60% of all returns that are being done are done by a professional. Okay, that includes H&R Block and Jackson Hewitt and Liberty, all the big guys, right? Most tax pros have been seeing lower year-over-year -year customer volumes, you know, shrinking margins for the past several years. So here's the stats. Chris put these together. Um, from 2011 to 2015, tax pros lost 3.65% of the overall full year e-file market. So we're talking about the entire tax season. In 2011, 6453 percent of all returns. That's, that's what we did in 2011, or tax year 2011. Tax year 2014, we saw that number dip to 60.88. I mean, 3.65 when you multiply that out over, I don't know what the total market is, 50 something million tax returns. That's that's a significant number. So H&R Block posted a 6.1% decline. If you read their annual report published by their CEO, he basically said, we're, we're getting our butts kicked. We've increased our marketing spend. We've increased the number of units, meaning locations, and we're still losing market share. So they were concerned. Well, what, what's happened? Well, into it, i.e., TurboTax, they posted a 12% gain in our time period. When we're making our money in the early season, they posted a 12% gain and a 9% overall. So they are gaining market share. So, not trying to, you know, overly depress you at this point, but just bringing some facts to light, and then we're gonna, again, bring it full circle at the end. So while tax pros e-file six out of every 10 returns annually, um, it's, we're losing ground in, in where we make our money the early season. In 2013, through week six of the tax season, tax pros had, again, 53.5% share of the e-file market, basically 13.45 million returns of the 25.12 million returns done at that time. Now week six of 2016, tax year 2015, um, we had slipped 10.65% to only doing 42.91% of that market. So 53.56 in 2013 to 42.91. So 11 million returns versus the 13.45 million returns done previously. Um, so th that is significant. Um, so again, opinions vary as to why this is happening, and I'm setting this up to really demonstrate how the PATH Act is going to level the playing field for us and provide us an opportunity to regain some of this lost market share, okay? So all of this doom and gloom sort of scenario that we just presented was really uh, just to set up the opportunity at the end. So has nothing to do directly with the PATH Act, but I thought it necessary just to kind of set the table, set the stage, and then we'll, we'll bring it around here at the end. So now we're going to go on to the, uh, hopefully you forget about all of this stuff, and we're going to talk about some of the specifics, the main takeaways. So PATH Act basics. Again, protecting against tax hikes, um, Bill HR 2029 was passed into law. December 18th, 2015. So right before Christmas, they gave us this little present, sort of. So we know that there are delayed refunds for certain refundable credits, EITC, Additional Child Tax Credit, American Opportunity Credit, right? All of our early filers. Why was this? Well, a lot of it has to do with trying to um, basically run interference on a lot of the fraud that was coming through. I mean, that is, the main thing that 
that it came from was we've got to stop all of these billions and billions of dollars of improper payments. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute. Now, we're also going to talk about certain provisions that were extended and or made permanent. Again, I'm not touching on all of them as it is a very long list of things, some of which does not have to do with our market, but um, I've provided a link in the uh, in the slide deck that will take you to those and provide you kind of a synopsis of each of those. Moving on, so the section 179 made permanent, right? Being able to uh, basically take a, uh, a purchase of an asset and write it all off in the current tax year. So for small business, you can immediately deduct up to 500K in investments. This is, I think, huge. So instead of having to depreciate the asset over a or the standard period, whatever the uh, useful life of that item is, three, five, 10, seven years, you can just drop your 10 grand on whatever it is, a new printer or whatever, and write it off in that current season. This is huge. I mean, it, it, it allows small businesses to go out, make capital investments, dump cash into the market, and um, then write that off in the current season. It's, it's fantastic. This will grow the economy. There's a number of people that have cited statistics as far as how much um, or what are the dollars that will be pumped in um, because of this, allowing businesses to, to make this, uh, these acquisitions. Okay, next item is something we do a lot of, the child tax credit. This has been made permanent. That's great for us. So what they were planning on doing was bumping up the dollar amount for a household to to qualify for the child tax credit. Okay, they were going to bump it up to 14 grand. Now that seems like a relatively low amount of income, but um, that would hurt a lot of our taxpayers. Um, what they've done is they've extended it or moved it down to the three thousand dollar level, which I mean that seems like such a low income threshold, but um, it's, it's, it's designed in order to try to help people move out of that poverty level, okay? So child tax credit, been made permanent. They, uh, EITC, the expansion of EITC, it's uh, obviously more generous for married couples and taxpayers with three or more children. There's several new anti-fraud provisions, um, the biggest of which was, again, delayed refunds. You're not seeing a dollar of EITC money until after February the 15th. This presents, uh, I mean, a, a huge number of challenges. One, our cash flow. So we'll talk about that here in a little bit as well. Um, but the banks have done some things to help us with that, providing in-season capital. And we're still going to be able to get these customers in, even though we, you know, they're, they're not going to know about this unless we get out and tell them early. I think it's our, our duty as professionals to communicate this effectively. I've talked to some people that said, man, I'm going to scare people off if I said, hey, they're not getting any money till after February 15th if you've got EITC returns. That makes up 65% of the returns I do. So it, it can be a little scary. Now you're going to have to take all this, process it, figure out the best messaging for your customer base to not scare them away, but at the same time educate them and empower them because if you don't tell them, you're only going to get away with that for, for one season. I mean, after that, um, one, they're going to know that you didn't tell them and they may consider going somewhere else because of the lack of transparency. So then we also have, um, sorry, skip the slide, real-time W-2 verification. We'll talk about this in detail here in a couple of minutes, but this is a significant anti-fraud measure as well. The um, AOTC, American Opportunity, introduced in uh, 2009. It's set to expire in 2018. It's a very generous um, credit for education expenses, um, much more than some of the other ones that are on the books. And a lot of people are looking at this and they've done the analysis and they don't think that the expansion or um, or leaving it in place really does anything kind of from a macro perspective. When they're looking at it, it 
does not impact college enrol enrollment. It's inherently fraud oriented. Um, unfortunately, it's taken advantage of quite a bit. Um, we are going to see some things with the uh, 1098Ts um, that the American Opportunity Credit is going to be uh, accompanied by. You're also going to see on your uh, 8863, that form has changed for the upcoming year. Um, it's going to take longer to do, especially if you have multiple dependents. Um, if they're, if you got child tax credit, American Opportunity Credit, basically there's a column for EIC, American Opportunity Credit, as well as child tax credit for due diligence questions. So we'll talk about that here in a second as well. The uh, bonus depreciation, they're planning on uh, kind of phasing this bad boy out. It's been extended till 2019, um, so it's a little bit broader coverage than the Section 179 that we already talked about. What they're saying is that likely they're going to do something with this, right? They bought themselves some time, and uh, but they don't know exactly how to tackle this particular item. So they're, they bought themselves some time to figure out how best to go about um, dealing with this, okay? Um, I'm not sure what that's going to look like, what it's going to do to anything, but that's, that's what I've read and seen so far. Now, I think one of the most ex, uh, extensive, one of the things that, they're, that it's going to have the biggest impact for this upcoming season is the accelerated W-2 reporting. Okay, so a little quick history lesson in terms of how this worked, and I didn't know how it worked until I started doing this research and uh, talking to a bunch of people. So the way that W-2 processing, right, your end of year wage statement for employers that are filed, the way that it used to work is you would take the W-2 information, you file the statement, and where does that go? Well, if you know, good for you, I didn't. It goes to the Social Security office. The Social Security office takes all that information and applies it then to basically all, all of the taxpayers' accounts, giving them credit for what they've paid in into their account, which is empty, which is bankrupt system, which is an entirely different discussion. Okay, so once they've taken that information, they've processed it, they would then get a finalized, verified, confirmed version of this, you know, the, the wage statement information, and then they would pump that over to the IRS, right? When did that happen? I had no idea. I thought that would happen relatively quick. Unfortunately, it doesn't. Um, it wouldn't get to the IRS until March time frame, right? Which is interesting. What we saw last year was when we had, we had a lot of EFINs. Um, I shouldn't say a lot. We saw some EFINs that started to get canceled, suspended, um, were put in a hold status, kind of frozen during this period. And I never made that correlation before, but it's because they're now matching W-2s. And unfortunately, what was put in the software or provided to the taxpayer and what the employer filed, they weren't copacetic. They weren't, they weren't matching up. So IRS is going through, looking at that, making sure those that had you know, statistically significant variances, they're going boom, 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 shutting them all off. And uh, so that's how that worked. So the deadline for wage statement filing is now um, January 31st, beginning January 1st of 2017 for tax year 2016. Employers have to submit W-2 wage and withholding data to the Social Security Administration and the IRS. So now the IRS and the Social Security Administration are basically going to have a shared database. And what they're saying of this database, because they haven't had it, the Social Security Administration hasn't had a chance to go through and really analyze the data yet, but it's being provided to the IRS. They're calling it kind of like a like a provisional. Um, it's a non-final version, non-verified kind of something. Okay. One of the other reasons why I think they're delaying refunds, one, to match everything up, and two, they're probably going to jack it up initially, right? They're going to have to match this up. So the previous deadline was the end of February for paper filers and March for W-2 data filed electronically. I mean, I can't imagine 
having that large of a time gap when you have that much money that was going out non-verified blows my mind that that's the way that they were doing it um, w-2s are still required to be distributed to employees prior to 131 that's no different um, the wage and tax statement deadline is now 131 beginning January uh, 1st of 2017 okay um, some of this I already touched on. The Social Security Administration will share a non-official record of W-2 data with the IRS. This will allow them to facilitate real-time IRS matching and validation of em employers' withholdings and all that good stuff. Um, the deadline was previously either end of February. Um, that The W-2, like I said on the previous slide, that's repeat was uh, it's still got you got to get that to the employee by 131 so in reading a substantial amount of online information um, specifically related to the do-it-yourself industry there is a lot a lot of fraud association associated with um, fraudulent w-2s okay it's way more significant in the do-it-yourself space than it is in the professional space. If you go online and look up anything with um, uh, whistleblowers that work for, I don't want to get sued, so I don't know how much I can say, whistleblowers that deal with or used to be employed with uh, large do-it-yourself firms, the onlines, there is uh, a ton of information that basically says that they did nothing, they did the absolute minimum to prevent online do-it-yourself fraud. So a lot of people have come out and said, hey, let's, let's do some stuff. Well, the IRS has a, um, what do they call it? They call it uh, a summit, security summit, where they've proposed all this stuff. This is the biggest one, I think, in terms of um, doing a lot of that. I mean. When I'm reading about the uh, the types of organizations that participate in exploiting the do-it-yourself market, we're not talking about one guy sitting behind a computer. These are sophisticated criminal organizations overseas that um, are basically pumping in all of this information, redirecting um, all kinds of obviously refund dollars. They have it down to an absolute science to you know, monitor the velocity, so how quickly they're putting the information in. And as soon as the uh, IRS closes one hole um, or closes one thing, they'll start exploiting another. There were a number of states last year that literally ended or stopped receiving e-files from certain online providers because the returns that were coming in were so fraudulent. And um, th they're smart. These, these guys that are doing this stuff are incredibly intelligent. Okay, so we know that the PATH Act has delayed refunds. So we've already talked about that. Money for the certain refundable credits will not drop until after February the 15th. Um, credits leading to the delays are earned income tax credit, additional child tax credit, and the American Opportunity Credit. Okay, so just to talk a little bit more about the fraud, I found some stats. They're a little old, but it just gives you a, uh, a good picture into what's going on in our industry and, and why this has all uh, come about. So this is from the Treasury Inspector General report, basically the, the group that audits all of government agencies. And this is showing from calendar year 2010 to 2013, the fraud statistics um, that are there. So you have IRS identified, taxpayer initiated, and then you have the total. So those are our columns. So the, from 2010, we had 338,000. I mean, that's statistically insignificant when we're talking total numbers of 50 million. Well, that number jumped drastically by 2013. I wish I had more current stats because I know they're even more insane than what we're seeing. So each of these, if you say, think the average dollar refund coming out of these is, uh, let's just say $2,000, you're dealing with 
you're, you're already up into the billions and they've estimated $48 billion in improper EIC payments um, just over the last year. Now, if you combine that over the last 10 years or five years, that number gets ridiculously insane. You can read the Treasury Inspector General report where they basically say the IRS is giving us one statistic, we're estimating it or have calculated it to be another, and there's, they're saying it's way higher than what the IRS thinks it is. And then if you look at people in the industry that I've talked to, they say that the Treasury Inspector report is still low. All of the banking partners that we've talked to um, say that that number is even underreported. So it it's a problem. So we, we know that uh, we're having the real-time W-2 verification is one of the other reasons for the delay. Okay. Now, how big of an impact is this? Um, well, here, here's the numbers. This was projected by Forbes. They're saying that the number of taxpayers impacted by these delays is going to be over 38 million taxpayers. That's that's huge. I mean, that's basically everybody we file pre our early season, right? We know that EITC drives our business, drives at least the the preseason or the early season business. So that's that's a little bit of a concern, right? The corresponding refund dollars that are going to be delayed is upwards of 120 billion billion dollars. That's that's a lot of a lot of a lot of money. So um, when we put this out, you can go ahead and read the Forbes article um, that's associated with that um, that references this and where we got these statistics from. Okay. So as we've alluded to, this creates um, cash flow problems for a, a lot of tax offices. Um, the uh, it, it's it's going to be challenging for a lot of people. Now the good news is the banks have done this um, for the last mm, couple of seasons that the um, the they're basically going to front everybody preparation fees up to a certain dollar amount. So that should offset some of the cash flow issues. What we're hoping, I mean us personally, is that everybody doesn't flip over to a cash and carry basis. Well, I don't think they will because the banks have provided us additional um, opportunities to um, to off basically keep the customer coming in and provide them some upfront cash. So we'll get to that. If you were a part of our bank webinar on Tuesday, we touched on that. The highest dollar limit that we're seeing the banks providing is uh, twelve hundred to a taxpayer, which is substantial. There's been a number of studies done that says six hundred dollars is the amount that would meet a taxpayer's immediate needs, basically catching them up on bills, stocking their fridge, and so forth. Um, but 1200 that's that's pretty attractive, okay? So real quick, I'm gonna tab over to one of the articles I had up, and uh, there's something I caught this morning that I should have put in my slides that I didn't, that was significant, um, and that was, where is it? I had it just right here. Uh, this one. Well, you've got the I-10 reform that's coming out. That's very big. If you're not up on that, I, I encourage you to read that. Um, I'm putting together a slide deck with all of those main takeaways. One, how to fill out an I-10 because we're getting a lot of comments about people filing for I-10s in addition to um, the retroactive element of uh, not being able to go back and claim credits for um, prior years for those items. Where are you, little thing? Pardon me. Da -da 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 -da. Anyway, basically you can't go retroactive. Once you get your social, you can't file for prior years in order to, uh, to get those credits. The other thing I wanted to touch on that I neglected to was the new EIC 2016 maximum credit amounts, okay? 6,318 bucks for three or more children, 5,616 for two qualifying children, 3,400 for one, and uh, 510 for no qualifying children. We are putting together 
the tax law updates slide deck as well. I'm I'm thinking I I'll just email that out to everybody as opposed to going through it in detail just because it is incredibly dry and challenging to make exciting. I'm not going to lie. I would have a hard time um, talking through all the points. So I think I might just, just blast that out um, to you all so you can click through it as, uh, as time permits you. Let's go ahead and jump back to, oops, I jumped out of our prezo. I don't know how many of you have given a webinar to where it's only one-sided. Basically, you're talking to yourself for 30, 40 minutes, but it is. It, it's, it's awesome. Let's just say that. Just kidding. All right, so this is where we left off. And so revisiting real quick. We've had uh, pro-tax prep space has suffered. Um, there's two schools of thought. And so this is where we start getting excited to a degree. We're, we're going to bring it back around. We're going to revisit what we talked on at the beginning because I hoped you had forgotten it, but we're, we're going to bring it back up. So two schools of thought. We have two negative pressures on our industry. We have the loss of the loan product. That was a big hit in 2011, right? They took away the, uh, the debt indicator. Oops, I need to go back to presentation mode. They took away the debt indicator and that killed us in 2011. The uh, FDIC um, took basically unprecedented measures to, um, to get rid of this. Basically, they committed all, if you read any sort of reports on the steps that the FDIC took to basically make it impossible for people to offer the loan product, which was not illegal, um, but they, they put uh, Republic Bank was the last one fighting for it in uh, 2013. I think it went away. We had two or three seasons without it entirely. Or 2012, sorry. Um, and that, that really put a damper on, on the industry. Um, and there's really no reason for it other than you've got a bunch of uh, you know, Johnny Do-Gooders that um, wanted to get rid of it because they thought it was predatory. Now that they, as we all know, everything that they do ends up hurting the taxpayer more. But um, nonetheless, the second thing is the do-it-yourself, also known as I mean TurboTax. They dominate the market. Their marketing spend dollars are insane, and uh, it's 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 a challenge. So why is that? Why has the do it yourself space grown over the last couple of years. Well, just to point these out, these are things that I'm going to give you counters to here in a minute, so don't get depressed again. The advancement of technology. We have access to information and mobile technology like we've never had it before. We've got a generation that's grown up on Wi Fi um, that has a phone in their hand 90% of the time or a computer or a tablet or something. Little fun fact, nothing to do with this, but just kind of uh, providing you some insight. 90% of mobile data usage is facilitated through a phone app. So anytime internet usage, data traffic, 90% of it is going through a, uh, a phone application, which is a huge transition from two, three years ago. Um, basically, if you're on your phone and you're on the internet, it's to Google an app or to Google something real quick and then you go back to your app. It's insane. There's a link here um, in smartinsights.com talking about those data usages and the transition and the trends over the last couple of years. I, I find them incredibly fascinating. It's, it's uh, pretty amazing the way things are moving. So the other reason is convenient, right? You get it instantly, you don't have to wait. It's whenever it's convenient for you, you jump on. Second reason that the DIY space has grown is because when you're behind your computer or your phone, nobody's asking you questions, asking you additional, you know, giving you a weird look when you say something crazy. Um, and you get to do it kind of, kind of anonymously, right? Um, they don't have to wait in line uh, for you and, uh, it's the convenience factor. Secondarily, the other reason why the tax, the DIY space has grown is the increased due diligence requirement. Now, there's no way to measure this. We don't have the ability to 
really say what percentage of the market is going online because the tax preparer, you guys, are now having to ask them all kinds of crazy questions. You and I know that it's pretty intrusive and we are basically the private investigation wing of the IRS now and that's on our shoulders and also with that is the associated um, due diligence penalties for that. Those have been expanded for the upcoming year. You need to know that for the American Opportunity Check credit and the child tax credit, they are also associating fines and penalties with those. So please, let's document, right? Contemporaneous notes are incredibly important, meaning taking notes at the time that you're interviewing the taxpayer and you've got to get creative with your question asking. There is a way to ask for tons of information without being intrusive. It just takes a little bit of forethought and, um, <laughs> and, and creative wordsmithing. So, uh, right, taxpayers don't have to bring in tons of documentation. They get to participate, and this is a term that Chris Smith um, from Express Payments came up with, um, or at least I saw in his, uh, his deck, refund engineering. They get to punch in all kinds of numbers. Uh, again, behind the anonymity of their, their computer or perceived anonymity of their computer and mess with it until they get the desired number, right? The other reason, cost reduction. They save money doing it online. It's a little less expensive. We know that statistics say that having a tax return professionally done on average yields the taxpayer 700 to 1200 extra dollars that they're not getting on their own. So whether that, I don't know exactly where those dollars come from, but you look for that statistic anywhere, um, whether it be from a CPA website or an EA website, and they're basically telling everybody that we, we, we know things to help you get a larger refund. The other uh, reason that people are looking at that and thinking that the DIY space is growing is you have a people that, a uh, bunch of preparers or quasi preparers, I'm using air quotes right now, you can't see me, but air quotes, preparers that are out there fee for service, cash and carry, and then sending people's returns through their TurboTax. Now, I know that they have like a, an IP address or device ID, five return limitation that they're imposing so that you, they're trying to limit these ghost preparers, but between mobile devices, tablets, and I think the statistic is you have like seven devices in every house that has internet capabilities, they can get creative and go through and figure out how to send these returns off, right? You send them as self-prepared returns, you don't have a P10 attached to it, you don't need an EFIN, you just need the internet and uh, a mobile device. So those ghost preparers are contributing to this as well. The loss of the loan, this was a big one. Um, in 2011, we've talked about this a couple of different times, I've made reference to it, is it was huge. It, it What it did was removed the loan product and a perceived lack of urgencies. Taxpayers were not or are not in a huge hurry to come in and get their taxes done or as big of a hurry knowing that they have to wait, right? And they're going to get asked questions and all this other stuff. So moving on to the silver lining, okay? So what is the opportunity? How can we regain market share? What has PATH done to level the playing field? What can we do to compete against the DIY market? Okay, and um, and and let's let's get it done. Let's make some more money. So the biggest takeaway from this is taxpayers have to come in person to get a loan. I'll say that again. Taxpayers have to come to a pro in person to get a loan. No do-it-yourself um, website, whether it's Tax Act or TurboTax or any, are going to offer them. For one, um, Intuit perceives the, uh, the loan product as a uh, class action lawsuit waiting to happen. They're not even offering it on their pro side, so whether you're using one of their products as Pro Series or Lacert, we're picking up tons of customers from those because they know they're going to get their butts kicked if they don't have a loan, okay? The other thing, with W-2 Verify, right, you can't file with a pay stub anymore. So this is huge for us. We can't do it and neither can they behind their computer. 
they're going to have the authentication code. Now, um, let's just, I'll jump to that in the next slide here in a second. But what this is doing for us is indirectly, and, and I won't say it's a level playing field, but what it's doing is it's leveling the playing field, um, which allows us to be more competitive and get regain those customers that we've lost in the last couple of years. Why is that? Well, I just talked about it. The W-2 verification cuts down on fraud and nearly eliminates check stub filing. So this is an excerpt taken from the Security um, Summit Partners uh, website, which I highlighted very quickly. And this is from the Authentication Work Group. I'm going to read it directly off the page, so sorry for boring you. The IRS and its partners in, pay, in the payroll and software industries will greatly expand a pilot program to add W-2 verification codes to 50 million forms, W-2 in 2017. The safeguard will be among the most visible to taxpayers and tax preparers in the 2017 file season. The verification code is a 16-digit alphanumeric code that taxpayers and tax preparers enter when prompted by their software product. A smaller test involving 2 million forms in 2016 was extremely successful in verifying the information on the forms. The objective in, is to verify the information at the point of filing and prevent fraudsters from using fake W-2s to create fraudulent refunds. They're also pushing this down to the state level because, like I said earlier, as soon as they close one loophole on the Fed, they'll try to exploit it on the state side, and they'll just keep evolving as we keep tightening up the constraints. So I think this is going to be huge. Um, this is going to <laughs> really be a driver. So for some offices, this is going to be a shock. And uh, but. This, this is going to make a significant impact on the DIY space, um, on the, the, the fraud that's coming out. Now that 16 digit alphanumeric code, I don't know how that's going to be derived. Um, I know that a lot of software, there's some sort of algorithm that's going to take federal wages, federal withholdings, EIN, and taxpayer name or something like that kind of concatenate all of them or put them into some sort of uh, arrangement that they'll they'll have this. So this is going to be, again, back to the IRS doing real-time W-2 verification. This is where it all kinds, kinds of works together. Where I th The other reason why I think they needed to delay refunds is because they know they're going to screw this up. And I'm with a very high degree of certainty saying that the IRS and the Social Security Administration and the uh, the payroll services are going to screw this up. I mean, I'm not going to stake my reputation or life on it or, or savings, which I guess those aren't worth much anyway. But um, we'll see. We'll see. So let's see. So again, we have that tool where they're leveling the playing field. Okay. The other big one is we need as professionals, as preparers, additional tools to compete with the convenience that the do-it-yourself market offers, okay? We are rolling out a phone application and I'm incredibly excited about it. It's um, one of the questions or one of the things we've been talking about a lot this year um, that is going to make an impact for a lot of offices. Um, everybody is texting me on a consistent basis saying, all right, can I download it now? Can I start playing with it? Is it in the software? Let me see. Give me all the details. Well, we almost have it all. Yesterday, I think, was um, they were testing the, uh, the Android version of the application. They've already tested the Apple, the iOS app, and uh, they are very, very close, and it is going to be very cool. So long story short, what is this going to do? How it works. So from your taxpayer experience, basically they never have to come in the office. That's, that's the biggest number one uh, selling point or, you know, convenience factor that we're going to be able to provide you. So, so what they need to do, they download the app. The app will, will release all the information, the links to the stores, um, all that good stuff here shortly with a demonstration videos of both the taxpayer experience and how you pull it into the software. So they download the app. 
they create account an account basically they enter their basic information their you know what you put on your client data screen birth date social blah 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 they then take pictures using their phone camera now they can either take the picture and pop them in or if they've emailed them to the sub to themselves they can then browse out to their picture library or screenshots and upload them so we've kind of thought about it from multiple perspectives then when they're done they've got everything in there they click submit at that point it generates a five-digit code okay so now what do you do you input that code so it's a five-digit code along with their last name and then you click retrieve basically you're gonna pull that bad boy into the software it's gonna populate all of the uh, the pictures in addition to their demographic information and so forth you then do the return based off of the information provided. You can correspond back and forth. So there's a messaging platform built into the software, built into their uh, the mobile device as well, or in the mobile app, so that you can submit a question. Hey, uh, you got this kid on here. This is looking a little funny. Can you shoot me something else, or social security card, or a picture of the kid, or something? You can kind of correspond. It keeps a log of that information in the software as well. So it shows that you've actually talked to the taxpayer and all that good stuff. It also has the, the phone app also has the ability for the taxpayer to take a selfie. So if you can verify their ID information along with the picture that they sent you in case it's some random dude that you've never had any before. It was a referral quote unquote, and you don't want to uh, participate in any identity theft. So uh, you can verify that information. You uh, do the return you submit it back to them for mobile signature. So instead of having to send an email back and forth and then the customer print it out, sign it, fax it back to you, who uses a fax machine anymore, seriously. Um, they can do it all in their phone. That signature comes back to the software and saves in the software. So this is a huge, huge convenience tool that allows us to compete with the do-it-yourself market, right? You don't have to come in the office. You don't have to wait in the line. Um, you don't have to ask them all those weird questions directly to where they can respond to you through chat or otherwise. So it's 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 a huge, it, it is honestly a game changer. The app is a game changer for you, okay? So we'll be putting that information out. I bet you it takes a year or so to catch on other than for you know certain demographics or 25 to 35 year olds that's not a knock on anybody older than that but I mean that's the reality of who uses phone applications okay the next biggest thing that gives us an opportunity to compete against the do-it-yourselves and we've already touched on it and I'm almost up to my time it's a good thing I think I'm this is the next to last slide we have a significant loan as I said the Last year we offered what 500, 700 bucks. That's cool. I mean, it's it it satisfies the immediate need for most taxpayers. But 1,200 bucks actually gets people excited. They've talked to, they've done a polling of taxpayers within the demographics that we're talking about, and they're pretty jazzed about 1,200 bucks. Okay, the IRS delays help us in this in, from this perspective. Customers are going to be starving for cash, sadly, but true, and they need money now. So if we can get them twelve hundred bucks, one, they got to come into a tax pro to get it, and two, you're going to be offering it. Now, the challenge that the industry has had in previous years is getting this message out. We have a new product, unfortunately none of us have the marketing dollars to drive a national campaign right none of us have 10 million bucks to throw down on a uh, you know a super bowl commercial or anything or commercial period we're we're running paper ads we're running facebook ads which are incredibly effective as well and um we just can't do it h&r block has a product which we all go oh crap they got a product too well this indirectly benefits us significantly H&R Block sets the expectation of the consumer in the market. When they didn't have a loan product, nobody was talking about a loan product. Now that they have a loan product, everybody's going to be talking about a loan product. So this them having the product is actually a huge benefit for us um, in terms of they're going to let everybody know it's back on the market. 
and then we get to clean them up. We get to get that money. Okay. The consumer advocacy groups. Um, I'll say that again. Consumer advocacy groups. I think I stuttered. Um, are also going to have media play here. They're, we're going to have you know negative attention is better than no attention at all. You know that they're going to be out there talking about the you know this new loan that's back on. They don't understand how it works. The fact that it's a non-recourse loan, meaning they're not going to come back and and beat the customer over the head to get their money back. They don't know that it is being charged to you. The fee to offer the product is being charged to the tax office, right? Okay, you guys are basically paying to have access to this to provide it to the taxpayer. Um, the other great thing is that you're not on the hook for the money. Okay, so with that being said, we can compete because we, there's delays. We can compete because we can now offer significant convenience via, via the phone mobile application to where they don't have to come in the office. We have a huge loan to offset the delays and to provide them a lifeline during this period. The uh, media is going, the media coverage is going to be out there. H&R Block is going to be screaming it from the rooftops and um, the consumer advocacy groups are going to be yelling back at them, you know, you evil person, you. So what do we need to do? Well, in all honesty, we need to do a couple of quick things. We need to do uh, our bank enrollment. We need to get you approved with the bank so that you can opt in to the taxpayer loan program and then once you're in and you know you have it which we're having a very high approval rate to for people to offer the loan they're also anticipating a high approval rate for taxpayers getting the loan okay and then we need to uh, start being obnoxious we need to tell everyone this is something that all of us did when we first started our business right we sold then we developed a business, we built the business up, and this is true for so many businesses and so many people in the tax business. Well, all that I had to do when I first started my business was sell because I didn't have anything. So I told everybody and all the time, uh, and then I got payroll, and then I had an audit, and then I had this, 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 that, and we stopped telling everybody. We stopped being our own best advocate. So we need to get back out there and get back into the sales mode. Every business needs a salesperson. Your reputation's great, and yes, that is uh, what will keep you in business. But driving business in this upcoming tax season is going to require you to get out there and do a little bit of marketing, talking to everybody, getting the flyers out, doing the stuff you did when the business first started rolling, and. Um, that, that's just the reality of, of where we're at when we build a business. Our time gets spoken for just maintaining what it is that we've built. And unfortunately, that takes away from driving revenue. And that is your prime. We're all in business to make money. We've got to drive the revenue, which is selling. Okay, And we need to do that now. So what I recommend at this point, just to get a, um, I gave you my highlights of the PATH Act. Um, I strongly recommend when we send this uh, send this slide deck out to go and review. This is on the best synopsis. This is uh, GOP.gov. I mean, it's a huge long link. It's, I think, in like the fourth slide. Go and uh, read this because it provides you a very good detail of what's going on. And we would have been here for two hours rather than one had I tried to cover all of this. So thank you very much. Um, super appreciate everybody joining. Um, we had a higher participation rate than I thought we would, which is great. I hope I didn't bore you all to death or tears or anything in between. And I hope you're all very encouraged that this upcoming tax season presents you with an opportunity to go back out and get the customers, get the market share that we've lost. Okay, um, we 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 can compete against the do-it-yourself market if we're aggressive. We get out there early, proactively, and communicate the value proposition that we have over them. We've got the convenience, we've got the speed, and we've got the loan product that we can get to these people quickly. So. I hope you guys are encouraged. Hope you're excited for this upcoming season. And uh, we're incredibly privileged to partner with you. And thank you very much for your participation. Um, have a great year. If I don't talk to you before then, happy Thanksgiving. And um, all the best. Thanks so much.